This lecture covers a section titled Area Between Two Curves, and I want to start by talking about the main goal for this section, then talk about what tools we've already looked at that are going to help us achieve that goal, and then do a couple of exercises. So our goal. What we want to know how to do is to find the area bounded between two curves. What do I mean by that? Take the shaded area here that lies between the curves y equals x squared and y equals x. Or for example, something a little bit more complicated, the area bounded between three curves and lines, y equals 1 over x, y equals x, and y equals 2. I want to be able to figure out what that shaded area is. Now what do we know so far? Well, we know that definite integrals give us what's called net signed area bounded between the curve y equals f of x and the x-axis. What does that mean again? Well, here's a definite integral, an easy one. The integral from negative 1 to 2 of x dx. And there's the graph below it of y equals x on that interval from minus 1 to 2. We know that whenever you integrate, you're treating stuff above the x-axis as positive and stuff below the x-axis as negative. Notice that the stuff below the x-axis is a right triangle, and that has an area of 1 half base times height, but you pop a minus sign in front of it to indicate that you're finding net signed area rather than actual area. The stuff above the x-axis on the right-hand side is also a triangle, so it's also going to have an area of 1 half times base times height. So you've got negative 1 half times 1 times 1 for the left side. You've got positive 1 half times 2 times 2 for the right side, which gives us three halves. And remember, this is not actual area, net signed area. So stuff underneath the x-axis treated as negative. Now, we also know that the underlying machinery for definite integration is called the Riemann sum. And using limits, Riemann sums allow us to turn approximations into exact area. There's the familiar expression, so it's a summation inside of a limit. The summation does what? It takes a region underneath a function and above the x-axis and splits it up into rectangles, finitely many. So here I've drawn five rectangles, right? That's a reasonable way to approximate, but there are all these little gaps or overages depending on how you draw the rectangles. Now to get a better approximation, you could say double the number of rectangles. Let's pretend that's 10. But if you want the exact area, you want to ask what happens if I let the number of rectangles go to infinity. And if you do that, you get no gaps, or the same as saying exact area. Now, we've seen that limits and sums are kind of a pain to deal with. We then uncovered this thing called the fundamental theorem of calculus that tells us how to solve definite integrals. And it says that if you've got a definite integral, like the one from the previous slide, you just take the antiderivative of the function you get 1 half x squared. You plug in the top bound, plug in the bottom bound, subtract those two answers, and in this case you get 3 halves, right? Same thing we got before using geometry. Now on to the question at hand, which is, how do I find the area bounded between two curves? Now, to be a little bit more formal about it, suppose you have two functions f and g, both are continuous, which, remember, is what you need in order to be able to ask the integration question, the area question. And suppose that in addition to both being continuous, f is larger than g, at least over the interval that we care about, a, b. And we want to find the area bounded between them, right? Something like this. So you've got a function f, function g. Their curves are such that f is over g, at least on the interval from a to b. And you want to find that shaded area between them. So curve on top and bottom, and then just vertical lines left and right to give us the shaded region. Now, a few minutes ago, and of course earlier this term, we said that if we integrate a function f over some interval, and for the sake of simplicity here, we're just assuming everything is positive, you get exactly the shaded area under f over the x-axis, and then cut off on the left and right by vertical lines a and b. If you do the same thing for g on the interval a, b, you get the area under g, right? So this is taking the two functions separately. 
Now, what if we take the area in that left picture and cut it out of the shaded area on the right hand side? In other words, I start with the full area under F, I subtract away the area under G. Well, these pictures aren't perfect because they're drawn by hand, but hopefully you get the idea. What you end up with is just the shaded area between F and G. Now, we want to phrase everything in the mathiest terms possible once we have our intuition down. So this is the same as saying that if I integrate f, I integrate g, and I subtract them, that'll give me the area between the two curves. Okay? From our basic properties of integrals, we know that we can combine integrals and break them apart if it's sums and differences the same way we do with derivatives. So here's our rule. Now, let's try some examples. Let's go back to that very first example I drew on the goals slide. We want to find this area bounded between x and x squared, and it's on the interval from 0 to 1, right? They're both pretty easy to graph by hand, so we know that the interval is 0 to 1. What's this rule that we just wrote down say? Well, it says take f minus g. What is f? f is the thing that's above or greater than. g is the thing that's below or less than. I integrate from a to b. I integrate, in this case, from 0 to 1, f minus g. Now, it's an easy integral, but for the sake of practice, if you want to hit stop or pause for a minute, work it out for yourself, and then compare answers, we could do that. But you should get a half x squared minus a third x cubed for the antiderivatives. Plug in 0 and 1 and subtract, the way we always do. And we get a half minus a third, which is 1 over 6. All right. Let's try the second example from the very first slide. Now, this was the region that was a little bit more complicated, right? Because it's bounded by 1 over x and by y equals x and by y equals 2. So it's this weird, um, like, wedge shape. Now, this one. You could probably still graph this by hand and figure out the intersection points or the intervals that we need, but let's just say we can't, right? And this will come in handy for even more complicated problems. If you want to find the intersections between curves, what do you do? You set their equations equal or their functions equal to each other, and you solve. In this case, we've got three equations, so we've got three pairs to set equal to each other. For example, if you set 1 over x equal to x, you're going to find this intersection point right here. right? So you set them equal, do some algebra, you get x equals plus or minus a half. And of course, since this is in the first quadrant, it's got to be the positive value. Then you could set 1 over x equal to 2. Well, that's going to give you x is equal to a half, and that corresponds to the point pointed to by the arrow there on the left-hand side. And then finally, you could set x equal to 2. Of course, there's no work to do there. You just get x is equal to 2. That's the intersection between the two lines, right? The horizontal line and the slanted line. Now, if you take those x values and plug them into their corresponding equations, you get the y values, right? So we could label each of those intersection points with ordered pairs. Now, remember, we want to integrate top minus bottom because we said you've got f of x is bigger than g of x, and you want to do the bigger one minus the smaller one. Well, what I like to do for problems like this is to draw a line or a dotted line through the region vertically and identify where I enter the region, what the bottom is, and where I exit the region, what the top is. Now notice here I've drawn two different dotted lines. The one on the left, the bottom is the curve 1 over x. The top is 2, the horizontal line. But the right dotted line that I've drawn, the bottom, the plate, point of entry, is y equals x, and the top is y equals 2. So the bottom is not the same the whole time in this region. What does that mean for us? Well, it means that... First of all, we need to identify the point where the change happens, where the bottom bound or bottom boundary 
is a better word, changes from y, from y equals 1 over x to y equals x. And it means that we're going to need two integrals, and that that intersection point 1 is going to be where those change. So maybe take a minute here and pause, go back and forth between this slide and the previous one, and make sure that all of this makes sense, that the intersection points are clear, that why we need to break up the integral or the region into two integrals is clear. And then see if you can set up the area integral yourself before um, allowing the video to continue and seeing the answer. Now, the area, again, is going to be two integrals. One that goes from a half to one, where one over x is the bottom boundary. And another that goes from one to two, where x is the bottom boundary. And in both cases, 2 is the top boundary, so you get 2 minus 1 over x, 2 minus x. Okay, both of these integrals are pretty easy integrals that I'm confident all of you could evaluate really easily at this point. So let's talk about another option here. Alternatively, we can integrate with respect to y. In order to do that, we need to integrate right minus left instead of top minus bottom. Okay, so remember in the previous slide I said I find it helpful to draw vertical lines through and identify point of entry, point of exit, or bottom and top. Well, now I'm going to draw a horizontal line. Okay, and I'm going to identify the point of entry on the left, the point of exit on the right. Now, we'll have to get all of the curves involved in the um, in bounding this region and express them in terms of y rather than in terms of x. For example, the right hand boundary is the slanted line, right? Well, that's the line y equals x, but I want to write it in terms of y. Now, in this case, it's not the greatest example because they just flip places, so there's no work to do, right? Same with the left. If you take y equals 1 over x and solve it for x, you just flip the places of y and x. Okay, uh, the later example that we'll do, I think, will illustrate this a little bit better. But at the end of the day, what we get is a much nicer problem because it's only one integral. We're going from 1 to 2, and we're integrating right minus left, which in this case is y minus 1 over y. Much easier, right? Much easier than solving two integrals. Okay, so again, maybe pause here for a second, make sure that all of this makes sense. Make sure that the bounds make sense, like why am I going from 1 to 2 rather than a half to 1 and 1 to 2. And then we'll move on to the next slide and go through the problem. All right, so we've got integral from 1 to 2, y minus 1 over y dy. Take the antiderivatives, and you're going to plug in 1 and 2 and subtract. So we get 4 halves minus ln 2 minus a half minus ln 1. Remember, ln 1 is equal to 0, so we get 3 over 2 minus ln is 2. Let's try another example. Say we want to find the area bounded between y equals x squared and y equals 2x. I'll say this now, and I'll say it again in class, I'm sure, several times over, but all of these problems are going to be well defined, okay? So it should not be ambiguous ever when the problem says bounded between these curves, which shaded region we're talking about, okay? Now, if you graph these two, the only region that's actually bounded, right, totally enclosed by both of them, is this one. And for the sake of practice, we'll do it two ways. We'll do it as a dx integral, and we'll do it as a dy integral. In other words, in terms of x and in terms of y. So what do we need to do? We need to figure out where the bottom is and where the top is, right? The boundary on the bottom, boundary on the top. Drawing a vertical line is helpful. We need to find the intersections. How do we do that? We set the curves equal to each other, their, their functions equal to each other. So we get x squared equals 2x. Do a little bit of algebra, do some factoring, and you get the two answers that makes sense according to the picture. x is equal to 0 and x is equal to 2. Now if you do this part by graphing and graphing carefully, also totally fine, right? A completely valid way of doing it.
Now here's our picture again just to keep everything in mind. We want to integrate 0 to 2 according to the intersections we just found, and we want to integrate top minus bottom. So the top is 2x, the bottom is x squared. We take the antiderivatives, we plug in 0 and 2, and the plugging in and solving here is pretty easy, right? You get 4 over 3. Now, let's try it the other way, right? The new way, which is integrating in terms of y. As a dy integral, we said we want to go from left to right. So you draw a horizontal line through, you figure out what it hits when it enters and what it hits when it exits the region. And now imagine sliding that horizontal line up and down until it fills in the whole region that you're interested in. Well, that's going to start at the very bottom at zero, where the two things meet, and it's going to go all the way up to where they meet again. But in the x integral, we were looking, of course, at x values. So they meet at x equals 0 and x equals 2. But if we're doing dy integration, we want to know where they meet in terms of y. Well, how do you figure that out? You just plug into the equations again. So we get when x is 2, y is equal to 4. Now, we also want to get all the curves in terms of y. So we're going to take each of the equations and solve them for x in terms of y. Okay, take a second to make sure that this makes sense. Right? You'll notice that y equals 2x becomes 1 half y. x equals 1 half y. y equals x squared becomes x is equal to square root of y. So that's our left and our right. All right, so area now, again, Integral from 0 to 4, right minus left. Now for the sake of practice when you're starting with these, trying to set everything up both ways is going to be really useful. But as soon as you set this up, you might decide, well, the x way seems easier because it's one integral and there's no square roots, which is completely fine, right? If the problem doesn't specify, do it whatever way is easier. But for practice, let's figure this out and see, make sure we get the same answer that we did before. So. Antiderivatives, 2 thirds y to the 3 halves, a quarter y squared, right? Because you've got that extra half out front. And then you plug in 0, plug in 4, and see what happens. So we plug in, remember to the 3 halves means cubed and then square root, right? So you cube 4, you get 64, take the square root of that, and you get 8. Or you could do it the other way around. You could take the square root and then cube it. Either way, you get 8. Um, 4 squared is 16. Divided by 4 is 4. So at the end, we should get 16 thirds minus 4, which is 4 thirds. All right, so that's it. Um, there are a bunch more examples in the homework, uh, several of which have worked out solutions that I encourage you to go and look through. And then we'll continue with this stuff in class.